Well, as I, the introduction said, I worked for a long time in the International Labour Organization. And although I was always regarded as a rebel, for some reason I rose to very senior position. And I'm the only person I know who I can honestly say it's good to be fired. Because I was fired three times, and each time invited back at a higher level than when I was dismissed. But I've resigned from the ILO some years ago, and I have no intention of going back. And if anybody is thinking of applying for a job in the ILO, my strongest advice is don't mention my name. <laughs> Except to say what a terrible person I am. Then, then you've got a good chance of getting a job. Now, when I left the ILO, I had been very worried about what I regarded as the ILO model of the 20th century. And I thought about it for a long time, and I wrote a book called Work After Globalization. In a sense, that book took me 30 years to write, because I really had to struggle to say, why was I angry about what was happening? And there was a certain point when I was presenting that book around the world, because it took off, when I started talking about the precariat, particularly with students or activists, you could hear the pin drop because of the attention. So I decided to write this book as a narrative that I hoped non-economists could read and understand. And I'm an economist, and therefore it was moving out of a comfort zone, if you like, to write such a book. Because you risk the, the charge from your fellow economist, ah, not enough statistics. <laughs> and you risk the problem with the ordinary lay person, who's not an economist, to say, well, look, it's, it's very interesting, but a bit complicated for me. You know, so you, you risk falling in between. But there's something out there, the energies and responses. It's now been translated into 13 languages. It's sold thousands and thousands of copies. I've been invited to present the book in over 300 places in 33 countries. Now, that doesn't happen to an academic. It's just crazy. It's like a dream. It could end tomorrow, but I'm not sure it will. Because out there, the precariat is growing. I'm going to come to it and define it and so on in a minute. It hasn't yet reached Denmark in many respects. I know that. Denmark, in a sense, has been resisting the international trends. But don't think it's not coming to Denmark, because it is. Now, I want to start by the thing that puzzled me for a long time which is that every age throughout history had, has had its stupidity about what is work and what is not work. And the 20th century, in my view, is the most stupid of all. Because it was the only century when labour, what you did for a boss, was regarded as the only form of work that mattered. So you, if you did labor, you got entitlements, rights, so-called rights. The statistics measure labor, but not work. And the very simple way of illustrating the problem is to say the following. I don't know your name, but supposing you hired a housekeeper. National income would go up, employment would go up, economic growth would go up. And the unemployment rate would go down. If you married her, and she continued to do exactly the same work, national income would go down, employment would go down, economic growth rate would go down, and the unemployment rate would go up. Now, you can't get more stupid than that, or sexist, right? And yet, still, our textbooks, our politicians, uh, statistics 
only measure labor, not all the work that many of us do most of the time, all the most valuable activities that we spend, caring for each other, caring for the community, developing our ca capabilities. <coughs> None of it counts in the official statistics. So you've got a very distorted way of looking at it, and it gives privileges to a particular type of activity that many of us don't want to do at all. We just do it because we have to, or whatever. So that's the starting point. The next contextual point in my narrative is that in the 20th century, there was a great transformation. I hope some of you have read Karl Polanyi's Great Transformation, where there was a disembedded phase dominated by financial capital, pursuing a market economy, until the insecurities and the inequalities grew so much that, as Karl Polanyi put it, there was the threat of the annihilation of civilization. Then you had the double movement with the re-embedding of the economy in society. Now his model broke down in the 1970s, and since then we've had the beginnings of a global transformation. The painful construction of a global market system. And of course, what we now call neoliberalism was dominant in the 1980s and has been dominant ever since. And what it's done is pursued a liberalization of markets, a commodification of everything that can be commodified, an individualization of everything, and for you and me, most painful of all, is a systematic dismantling of all institutions of social solidarity, including occupational communities, including the corporation as a place you entered and you became and you developed and you became a member of a community, between your occupations and professions, between the, the nature of our social solidarity, social security system, all of these things were dismantled. And in doing so, what you've done, not you, but what the politicians have done, is create a very individualistic society in which there's very little social mobility, because you cannot enter and remain in communities, and the things I'm about to talk about have taken place. But the point I want to make as a key to what I'm about to talk about is that, historically speaking, in the 1980s and 1990s, the world's labor supply quadrupled. In other words, an extra two billion people became part of a global labor market. And all of those two billion were habituated and resigned to labor for one-fiftieth of what any Danish person would have accepted. Right? Well, you don't have to have a PhD in economics to realize that that is going to put huge downward pressure on our wages and living standards of workers. It's obvious. And you cannot be King Canute and hold back the waves in those circumstances. But they tried to do precisely that. Because in the 1980s, when all of these things were taking place, the governments, in effect, made a Faustian bargain with all of us. The Faustian bargain was, look, we can't let your living standards go plunk. We're going to let you have an orgy of consumption. <coughs> have a great boom. Spend more. Have more cheap credit. Have more tax credits. Have more labor subsidies. Have more this, have more that. Enjoy yourself. Meanwhile, the politicians have been doing all of these things, this neoliberal agenda, with euphemisms like you've had in Denmark, like flexicurity, you know, words that just mean what they want them to mean. 
anything. Flex security. <coughs> now we've seen it's happening, and the Faustian bargain, of course, couldn't go on forever. And sure enough, in 2008, we have the financial crisis. Since then, we're all being told, you eventually, austerity. Austerity. We've got to have austerity. That means you've got to cut public spending. We've got to tighten our belts. We've got to pay down the debt. That didn't need to happen. Because meanwhile, having changed the rules, capital has earned vastly more. We didn't need Thomas Piketty to tell us that. What's happened is that the functional distribution of income has become vastly skewed so that the returns to capital and rent from intellectual property and so on has gone up and up and up, whereas the share of national income going to labor, to workers, has been going down and down. And this is happening everywhere, all over the world. And ironically, it's happened most in China, where the percentage of national income going to workers has fallen 20 percentage points in the last 20 years. In the United States, it's fallen by more than 10 percent, and that's a great, a great change in a very short amount of time. In Europe, it's still changing, and in some countries it's changed more, other countries are catching up. Get me? Get me? Where we're going? In Sweden, Sweden is now the country with the distinction of having the fastest rate of increase of inequality of any country. Sweden. When I was a young student, we were always being lectured by the Swedes. The Swedish model, you know, it's love, it's the home, cradle to grave. Go there now. Go there now. So what we've got is a situation where inequality is growing. And underneath that is a new class structure that is taking place. It's a globalized class structure that corresponds to the globalizing system. And it's profoundly different from the old class structure. At the top, we have a plutocracy, not the 1% but the 0001% of disgustingly rich people, mostly criminals, many mad, many very dangerous, but of course they have power, and power creates truth. They are the people who are manipulating the media, manipulating our universities and all institutions to say a certain narrative that corresponds to the preservation of their interests. It's a powerful, very powerful phenomenon. We have never, ever seen anything like it, and yet we do not have a strategy on the left to defeat it. But come back later to that. Below the plutocracy, there's a salariat, what I call a salariat. Again, when I was a student, we, when we were studying labor economics, we were told by our peers that by the end of the 20th century, everybody in a country like Denmark or Great Britain or the United States, everybody would be in long-term employment with stable jobs, pensions, medical leave, paid holidays, all the trappings. Tragically or untragically, that is far from the reality today. The number of people and the share of the population in long-term employment is shrinking everywhere. And the, the advantages they have are shrinking too. And it's strange that I've received many, many, many emails from many people in the precariat that I'm about to talk about, but I've also received quite a lot from people in the salariat. 
And the reason is, they tend to be worried about their sons and daughters. <laughs> Not going into the salariat, but into the precariat. Now, underneath the salariat, or rather just alongside it, there's a growing group, and maybe some of you in this room are belonging to this group, what I call proficients in the book. Proficients don't want employment security. They are, they are clever. They've got their skills in their head. They've got electronic gadgets over their shoulders. They've got business cards. They rush between airports and flashy hotels. They're making a lot of money, a lot of money. They're very smug. They tend to be self-righteous. They tend to be right-wing libertarians. Why can't you be like me? I'm clever. Their only problem is at about age 28 and a half, they have burnout. <laughs> and they take to drugs and stronger drugs and end up being even more useless human beings, dysfunctional. But they're important because they're setting a model. And, you know, you see them on television in glossy magazines with their glossy girlfriends or glossy boyfriends or whatever. Below those groups, is the old working class, the proletariat, for which the welfare states were built, the labor unions were built for them. But they are no longer strong. They are shrinking everywhere. <coughs> Their agenda looks like yesterday. They've lost the vocabulary of progress. That is the reality. Underneath the old proletariat, is the precariat, which I'll define in a second. And underneath the precariat is a lumpen precariat, an underclass. I just arrived in Copenhagen from Aarhus, and I promise you, on the way here, I was asked by five beggars to give some money. Five. I've only just been here. But that's not unusual. All our cities are like that today. We have a huge number of people who've been reduced to being slowly dying out in the streets, holding out their hand, and if we have a few coins, we give some. That's a society that calls itself modern and affluent. But the precariat is not part of an underclass. The precariat is wanted by global capital. It wants a flexible, adaptable labor force that it can use and abuse. There's no getting away from it. And you can define the precariat in three dimensions. The first dimension is the one that all the commentators on my book have been focusing on, and however many times I say it is not the most important, they often say, standing defines the precariat as that. The first is that the precariat has distinctive relations of production. And what that means, it's a Marxian term, as many of you will know, what that means is that people in the precariat are being habituated to accept a life of unstable labor, an unstable living, insecure labor statuses, casuals, interns, zero-hour contracts, all of these temporaries, all of these terms that have come, and they were called atypical. It's a stupid word because they're not atypical. They're increasingly the norm. They're increasingly the majority. I've just come back from Japan. And the estimates are that more than 50% of the total labor force have these, have these types of situations. Now, we're seeing a new phenomenon that is gradually taking shape. There's a, there's a journalist here who wants to talk to me about some of these, which goes under the term crowd labor or cloud labor. Most people, including most trades unions are not aware of what the hell I'm talking about when I talk about crowd labor. 
but it is the most rapidly form of labor transaction, the rapidly growing form of labor transaction. People in the industry say that within the next 10 years, one in every three labor transactions will be done online, electronically. Increasingly, people are neither employees nor really self-employed. They are dependent contractors. They're what I call taskers. They get contracted to do a task online and they may or may not get paid for it depending on whether the labour broker thinks that they've done a good enough job or been polite enough because they have discretionary power, these labour brokers. And the worst form that is growing around the world involves a certain type of Dutch auction. I'm glad I'm not speaking in the Netherlands. Some of my Dutch friends might object. But I don't know if you talk about a Dutch auction in the way we do. A Dutch auction is, at the beginning of a week, the labour broker may go online and say, we have certain number of tasks, accounting, legal, medical, that have to be done. We will put them out to bid, right? We will say, we offer you 100 kroner an hour, or whatever it might be, okay? We will close the bidding on Friday lunchtime, and whoever's offered the lowest bid will get the job, all right? So you find people who in Boston are competing against people in Bangalore, competing against somebody's in Nairobi, all unsure of what the others are actually offering, right? So this is tending to bid down the wage rates to a new form of what we call sweating. I don't, I don't know if this term is familiar, but it's sweating, you really sweat to do the work. So you're not only lowering the wage rates to a very low level, but people accept those contracts because they're so desperate that they work actually longer than they, than they contract to perform. Now this is a phenomenon which is altering the labor market profoundly as we sit here, okay? But we also see that within the different occupations, including academic occupations, including the medical professions, the legal professions, we're having the class structure reproduced inside it. So you have an elite, a salariat, and a growing precariat in every occupation, including academic life. So your tenured professors are subject to like football transfer fees, you know, between universities. If you could come with publicity and all that, you'll get transfer fees. Then you have tenured professors, tenured people, but a growing number of precariatized people below them, without contracts, without promotion prospects, without any sense of identity. And that leads to the second aspect of the precariat. Because people in the precariat have no occupational identity, no occupational narrative that they can give to their life. I was on a plane a few weeks ago and a couple of young women next to me, I thought they were chatting to me, but it wasn't me that they were interested in. They didn't know how to fill in the visa form because at the bottom it said occupation. And they didn't know how to define themselves. This lack of occupation, identity, is a profound feature of being in the precariat. Another feature is that people in the precariat have to do a hell of a lot of work for labor that doesn't get counted as work. They have to retrain because the last lot of retraining they did didn't get them anywhere and is obsolescent today because things have moved on. They have to network more because the last people they were networking didn't get them any open doors for, for opportunities. You have to do a lot of that. If you're in the precariat, you have to spend an incredible amount of time applying for jobs. There are people out there, and I've heard from thousands who send me emails with different parts of the story I'm telling, but quite a lot tell me this one which is they will apply to thousand jobs and not get one interview, 
right? There's a survey recently showing that those with MBAs, Masters of Business, okay, from top universities, on average have to apply to 38 jobs before they get one interview. That's not one offer, that's one interview, right? And each one of those 38, on average, involved six layers of applying. In other words, you apply, and you apply online, and the algorithm works it out. You've used the right words, madam. Well done. We, you are shortlisted. You actually don't realize, but you may be shortlisted to the bottom 5,000. <laughs> then they ask you to do an aptitude test. It may take you an hour. The algorithm, it doesn't matter. It's, it's instantaneous. There's no cost to the firm, right? Then they say, aha, well, now you must take a technical test. And now you must do this and that and the rest of it, a personality test. And it turns out that it, on average, six of these things goes on. So you multiply six by 38, and you get over 200, right? Of oh, That's what's happening. But if you're down in the precariat lower than that, it's not like 200, it's more like 500 as an average. That's the sort of thing that's using up time. And what it means is that people in the precariat are suffering from what I call the precariatized mind. Because they don't know what is the best use of their time. Should I do a bit of this? A bit of that? A bit of this? Should I check my emails? Should I check my iPhone? Should I do this? Should I network? Should I call her up just in case? Must make sure she doesn't forget me, blah, blah, blah. So people, people in the precariat are suffering from a time squeeze which is incredibly stressful because you're not able to be in control of your time. Another feature of the precariat is very strange. And I think some of you in this room are understanding this one in particular, painfully. This is the first time in history when the mass growing class of working people have a level of education greater than the level of labor they can expect to perform. That is an extraordinary development. Unlike anything in the past, some of my Marxist friends have said, standing is only talking about something that's always been there. I disagree profoundly, but when it comes to this one, I don't know what they have to say because this has never existed in history. In the old days when you were entering the proletariat, you probably didn't have much education at all. You came from primary school or whatever. But today you will find people with advanced degrees having to do menial jobs without a future. All right? Now, the second dimension of the precariat is that people in it have what I call distinctive relations of distribution. What this means is that they have to rely almost entirely on money wages. They don't get access to non-wage benefits under collective agreements and things like that. Pensions? You're joking. Paid holidays? Bad joke. <laughs> Paid medical leave? I wish. You know, you get this, none of, the, none of that applies. In addition, the precariat don't have any access to rights-based state benefits because they've disappeared. They either haven't paid enough contributions to get to some sort of social insurance benefit or the government has turned them in over to a means-tested system where you only give the benefits if you are poor. And if you prove you are poor, and beyond that, because you might choose to be poor, and you look the type, you know, you choose to be poor, we have to prove that you're a deserving poor. Okay, so we have to have a whole lot of tests. Use up a hell of a lot of your time proving that A, you're poor, and B, you're a deserving poor. So what we have now is millions of people put in severe poverty traps. A poverty trap means 
that if they get entitlement to a means-tested benefit, unemployment benefit, disability benefit, or whatever it might be, then moving from that to a low-wage job means that they would lose almost as much as they gain from the job. In Denmark, this poverty trap works out to be 84%. In other words, going from low benefits to a low-wage job, you would only increase your income by 16%. All right? But then you've got to take account of your commuting costs, your clothing, your, all your other costs, so you're actually not going to get any extra. But the situation is worse than that for the precariat. Because of all these tests and things, do you think you get your benefits tomorrow morning if you lose your job today? You're joking. It turns out that millions of people around Europe have to wait not days, not weeks, but months before they get to any benefits. Now, supposing you're in the precariat and you've been going through that experience, you've gone into debt, you used up your friend's goodwill, you've probably got a child that is sick because you can't afford the medicine, the situation is out of control, you suddenly start receiving the benefits. And then a bureaucrat tells you, you have to take that job that's just come up the other side of Copenhagen. It's only a minimum wage job. It's a casual job. It has no benefits, but you've got to take it. Otherwise, you lose your benefits. That sort of behavior by unaccountable bureaucrats, without any due process, without any legal process that's taking place is precisely the experience of a lot of our fellow citizens. All right? So you basically say, if you took such a low-paying job the other side of Copenhagen, you would be an idiot. You would be an idiot because very soon you'd have to start the process all over again, queuing, filling in more forms, and this time proving that you didn't deliberately lose the job and that those slippers under your bed are not the slippers of a lover who's supporting you. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but that is the way people are being treated. Okay? So now we have a situation where people are exposed to low wages, wages will not rise, no benefits, uncertainty, and are on the edge of unsustainable debt. Debt has become a mechanism of exploitation. Debt at high interest rates is one of the worst phenomena for the precariat. And the third feature, the third dimension, is that the precariat has distinctive relations to the state. And what I mean by that is that this is the first class, mass class, which is systematically losing the rights that citizens have taken for granted for decades. It's a very strange phenomenon. I use the term in English, I don't think there's a translation into Danish, I've asked several people, maybe there is. I use the term denizens. A denizen was a term used in the Middle Ages to refer to somebody who, when they came into a town, was given a more limited range of rights than the people living in the town. You know, they could do certain things but not do certain other things. This is the first time historically when we're taking away rights. We're taking away civil rights, like the things I just mentioned earlier, no due process. I don't like your behavior, your tone of voice, you lose your benefits. I decide. There's no legal process. That's a loss of civil rights. And it makes it extremely costly to, for you to try to take the bureaucrats to court. You are losing social rights because the benefits that are given are not rights at all. They are determined by whether we accept your behavior one way or another. A right is no longer a right. 
We're losing economic rights because people who are qualified to practice are not enabled to do so. They can't join a viable occupational community. They're often finding that even though they're qualified, they can't practice. They're losing cultural rights because they're denied the opportunity to be a member of a cultural community with the reciprocities and the social solidarity and the ethics of behavior that go with being a member of a community. And finally, they're losing political rights. Because if you're in the precariat, you do not see any political movement that represents me. No political movement. And that is one of the reasons why the Social Democrats, the Labour parties, the old parties of the centre-left have lost it. They're dwindling everywhere. They have no vision. They have no response. They don't relate to the precariat at all. And the reason why the precariat is a dangerous class is that it is rejecting the old forms of laborism and social democracy. It's rejecting the neoliberal agenda. And therefore, it's looking for a new politics. But part of the precariat are people who have fallen out of working class communities and families. Their fathers or mothers were working class occupations with pride. A docker, a car worker, a steel worker, or whatever. A construction worker a craftsman, they cannot even get that. And these people may not have much education, but they're angry because they cannot even get what the past gave to their parents. And so they and their parents tend to listen to the neo-fascist populist far right. Your Danish People's Party, UKIP in the UK, Marine Le Pen in France, we all know these groups, but they're dragging, playing on fears, dragging people to the far right. Part of the reason is that no politics of paradise is being offered as an alternative. And of course, these populist politicians play on the fear of the second part of the precariat. The second part consists of the migrants, the Roma, the Muslims, the disabled, different groups. These people tend to have no sense of home. No home, and therefore they are nostalgic. They keep their heads down because they need to survive. But every now and then the pressures get too great. And there are days of rage, like there was in Stockholm last year when I was there, the four days of arson, you remember those. Those things are happening more and more because the migrants are really under terrifying pressure. They are the most exploited part of the precariat. They are being used, abused, demonized, and we know the rest. But the third part of the precariat consists of the educated. The people who went to college or university and they thought and they were told by their parents, if you do that, you will get a career. You will get a high quality life. You will become somebody. But they realize that now when they go to university or college, most of them buy a lottery ticket. The lottery ticket costs more and more and promises minimal chance of success. So an enormous number of educated people not only experience that, but know they're being exposed to an increasingly commodified education. An education that doesn't promise the enlightenment values, philosophy, your culture, your art, your history. None of these matter because you've got to be prepared for jobs. 
But all the great enlightenment values of education are denied increasingly to people in the precariat. Meanwhile, the elite and the salariat can continue to go to the top few universities and they get that enlightenment education. But increasingly for the precariat, it's a functional commodified form. And you will often meet students who are no very well. They weren't sold an education. They were sold a preparatory process to become a commodity themselves. Those are realities. So we have the situation, losing rights, and this leads to what I regard as the worst single feature of the precariat. And that is people in it are really supplicants, beggars, because they have to be asking others for help, for favours, for good treatment. It's an indignified way of living, but we're forcing millions of people close to that. They're not like the beggars out there, but they know that if they make the wrong mistakes, they could end up like those outside. So we've got a situation where the anger is growing. Part of the precariat is going to the far right. Past doesn't know where it's happening. But, and here's the good news, but the third part, this educated part, is the growing proportion of the total. And out there, there's a huge energy demanding change. And if you look historically at transformations, three things have to happen. There has to be a struggle for recognition, a struggle to move from the situation of being defeated and being useless and being a failure. When you look in the mirror in the morning, if you have a mirror, and you see a failure, and you feel sorry for yourself. Moving from that to a situation where you can look in the mirror and say, hey, I am one of a million. There are a lot of people out there like me. I'm part of the precariat. And why should I be ashamed? In many ways, I'm free. I have a freedom. I need to preserve that freedom, but have the security to enable me to develop my capabilities in a new world of work and living. That is what's been happening since 2011. The Occupy movement, the Indignados, the Den Plurono in Greece, and it's gradually turned into a political movement like Podemos, which is a precariat party in Spain. This time last year, Podemos didn't exist. They formed and within a few weeks, they got 1.2 million votes in the European election and got seven MEPs. When I was in Madrid, in Barcelona, before Christmas, because the books have come out in Spanish, meeting the Podemos leadership, the opinion polls show that they are equal number one with the government party. And the agenda is increasingly like the charter that I've tried to write. So the things are changing. Now, if I don't offend you by telling you the story one more time. It's okay. Yeah? She was, th she was heard it, so I, I apologize to her. And there's one other person, I think, who's heard this story. But symbolizing this change of mood, I was addressing an Occupy movement in the United States. Huge number of people outside, bonfire, plastic chairs, Somebody's f fleeing this story. <laughs> and I was talking about the precariat and talking like this. And suddenly a man at the back, a bit like you, sir, okay? But he, he had an open shirt, you know, and he drunk more beer than you'd, you've drunk, you know. He had a big bear belly, bear belly. He came striding out, pushed through the crowd with his chair over his shoulder like this. I thought, what is it I've said? No. You no, know, what have I said? Came right out in the middle, plonked his chair down, crossed his arms, looked round with a fury, huh? and then sat down, 
looking at me. I thought, well, better, better just continue, pretend this happens every day, you know. <laughs> so I went on talking, and about five minutes later, suddenly, he stood up, crossed his arms, looked around, got everybody's attention. And then very theatrically, he said, it's me he's talking about. <laughs> and all I could do was just go like that. Because basically, people are recognizing that they are part of the precariat. And roughly the same thing happened to me in a meeting in Stockholm when somebody stood up at the end. I hadn't said that story. And he shouted from the big audience, about 300 people in the room. He said, I hated your speech. Hated it. I, I, I said, oh, I'm sorry. You know. Then he said, it's all about me. It's all about me. And that sense of recognition is very important because you only get agency. You only get the beginnings of a fight back when people identify themselves as part of a group. The next stage of the struggle is a struggle for representation by the precariat. Instead of being treated as objects to be made more employable, more retrained, or uh, you know, more socially responsible, or whatever the term might be, their voice of the precariat should be in every agency in every trade union, in every institution, on the governance boards of, a, a, of all educational establishments, all of our organizations, the voice of the precariat must be there. And the third struggle, which is only just beginning, is a struggle for redistribution, a struggle for the revival of the great trinity of the French Revolution, more egalité, fraternité, liberté. But egalité of what? That's the big, big issue today. And it's one I try to address in the book. What are the key assets that the precariat need and don't have? Well, there are five. And the first one is security. Security. Because people in the precariat have no security at all. The inequality of security in our societies may not be in Denmark yet, but please watch things. The distribution of security is chronically unequal. If you're up here, you have every possible way of having security. If you're down in the precariat, you have no security at all. The second asset is time. Control of time. Time is an asset. We need a politics of time that is profoundly different from the old discussion about working time and working hours and unsociable hours. They won't work these days. If you try and limit working time by hours of work, people actually get more exploited off working time and outside workplaces. That's the reality of the precariat. That's why, since the French introduced a 35-hour week, the average working time in France is now above 35. You know, that's the reality of a flexible labor system. The next asset is education. We need a campaign for the decommodification <laughs> of education for the precariat and people who might be in the precariat. We really need a powerful campaign to redistribute access to enlightenment education. The next key asset, if you're in the precariat, is quality space. Quality space. Because increasingly what has been happening is the encroachment on the commons, on the public space, on the public amenities, has been denying a vital part of life for people who depend on it. If you're up in the salariat or in the elite, you have big gardens, you have second homes, you have access to islands, and etc. If you're down in the precariat, you depend on the parks, you depend on public libraries, you depend on public toilets, you depend on many of the social 
commons that give you a chance to have a good life without having to spend too much. And yet we are seeing the privatizing, the shrinking, the taking away of the commons. The example I give, which I gave yesterday, but it seems just as relevant today, is they've just closed all the public toilets in Manchester. Well, if you're part of the Salariat, you probably can go home. But if you're part of the Precariat, you're in and out and da-da-da, you need things like that. The same with public libraries. So that, that part, we need a struggle for the revival of the commons. That is why Getchy Park, you remember Getchy Park in Istanbul? was an outpouring of the precariat when they saw the shrinking commons. And while we had 200 cities in Brazil exploding, it wasn't about bus tickets, it was about the fact that privatizing of land was taking away space. And the last two assets of financial knowledge, which is very badly maldistributed, if you're a part of the salariat, you can buy financial advice you can avoid taxes, you can get subsidies, you can get tax breaks, etc. If you're down in the precariat, you have all these complicated forms, you have no one to help you, your time is short, and you make mistakes and you end up paying more than you should. That's the reality. And finally, we need a strategy for the redistribution of financial capital itself. Capital. We don't care so much about the old socialist project about controlling the means of production. If I talk like that, the precariat rushes out. What we do care about is that the distribution of total income is going more and more to the top without any justification, any justification at all. And we've got to find the mechanisms to capture part of that and redistribute it to everybody down and below. And that is why I strongly support and have advocated for many years a universal basic income <coughs> as a right of everybody. A right of you, of you, of you and the children and every generation. We must move towards that system because it's the only way to give basic security to people who are facing chronic insecurity. There is no alternative and it is also a way of redistributing income. And when anybody says it's unaffordable, tell them to take a jump off this building or any other building. They can afford quantitative easing. They can afford huge subsidies to corporations. They can afford spending vast amounts on military expenditure, etc., etc. It's a matter of priorities, and it's a matter of us putting pressure on them to move in this direction. But it's also a matter of social justice. The example I gave is that last year I was invited to Middlesbrough. Most of you will not know Middlesbrough, but there'll be a Danish equivalent. I felt when I was walking down this street that I could be in Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough was a small village in the 1820s. And then they discovered iron ore in Middlesbrough. And within 10 years, Middlesbrough became the center of the British Industrial Revolution and the center of the British Empire. So if you go to Sydney, as I was recently, Sydney Harbour Bridge, that wonderful bridge, is built with the iron ore from Middlesbrough. If you were to go to, sit to San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, it was built with iron ore from Middlesbrough. But when I was invited there, to talk about the precariat, I was taken around the old town and everywhere you see workers' houses boarded up with blocks of concrete, you see the little gardens all overgrown with weeds, you see people hanging around on the corners with little or nothing to do and you see pity everywhere. Meanwhile, down in the south of the country, the descendants of all those who made the profits from the iron ore industry are back in government, having gone to private schools and 
universities, and they're running the country. In those circumstances, you should think of what Thomas Paine, a very underrated great man, he said that the wealth and income of any of us is far more to do with what our ancestors did than anything you or I do or did. Your standard of living is due to the past people's efforts, but we don't know whose, maybe yours or mine or everybody's. And therefore, as a matter of social justice, we should all be sharing a social dividend, a return on the investment they made, because that's a matter of equity. I think that argument is a powerful one for saying a basic income is needed. We did some pilots of all places in India, and we gave 6,000 people every man, every woman, every child, in nine areas. We gave them a basic income, unconditional. You could do what you like with it. And we monitored over 18 months what happened. The book over there tells the results. I wasn't surprised, but I was surprised by the strength of what happened. Because what happened was really transformative. Those villages, the welfare improved, nutrition of the children, the schooling of the children, the health care improved. That part was good. But they also were working more, not less. They were more productive, not less. And experimental, psychological experiments of various countries around the world, rich and poor, show that people who have security work more, not less. They're more altruistic, not less. They're more tolerant of others. So you get social and economic benefits of moving in that direction. And we also saw that, and I was puzzled by this, and you see it in the book, but that the emancipatory value of the basic income is greater than the monetary value. Because I kept going to these villages and say, why is it that so many of these results are so positive when we've only given a small amount. But it, what happened is that people have a sense of freedom because they can see their security, and therefore they make better decisions, and they gain their freedom. I broke down when I found a man who'd been a bonded laborer for 35 years. And when his, he and his family started to receive this modest basic income, for six months they all saved, saved, saved. And they bought his freedom. But the most touching thing was that one day I was in a village and I said, I remember when we started this pilot, that all the young women in this village had veils and wouldn't see us and show their face in the village. We had to have their photographs taken so they had a card to get the basic income each month, right? They had to do it in a small hut, private, etc. Only women, etc. Six months later I was in the same village and I said, have you noticed? Something's changed. All the young women are out, about, without veils. They're just talking. And why? So we got some of them and they said, ha, 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 ha. Now, the elders don't have control over us. We can do what we like, because we've got a little money ourselves. That's emancipation. Now, I think, of course, that a basic income would have different behavioral effects if it was done in Denmark or somewhere else but it would have those emancipatory qualities. It would have the quality of giving you more control of your time, more bargaining power, so that if a really disgusting employer was taking advantage of your fact you've got a small baby or something like that to push down your wages, you could in extremists turn around and say, no, 
that powerful ability to say no. I hope that some of you will join the Basic Income Network of Denmark and our international network because in the last few years thousands of people have been joining. It's a movement that is exciting to belong to. There are some fantastic people who are joining it. But we have to fight for a new future, a revival of the future, not just endless consumption, consumption, consumption. And that, I think, is why uh, the precariat is leading us, whether it's in southern Europe or anywhere else. They're growing, the energy is growing, and they're beginning to fight back. And that's the best news of all. Thank you very much.